When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Have you ever heard this? Has someone ever shared this wisdom with you? I remember once I was in a car accident and one of my friends lovingly shared this deep wisdom with me and I'm like, how do I make lemonade out of my car which is now totaled and on the road? If you've Never had this phrase said to you, uh, it, it makes sense, but you're like, I don't get it. Help me out. This is a phrase that initiated in 1915. Uh, there was a author named Albert Hubbard who wrote this phrase or something just like it about a man who was a dwarf actor. He's circled there in the yellow. His name was Marshall Pickney Wilder, and it was his obituary when he had passed away. Here's what it says. Hubbard wrote this. He was a walking refutation of that dogmatic statement, mens sana in corpore sano, which is loosely translated as healthy mind, healthy body. For Wilder was a sound mind in an unsound body. He proved the eternal paradox of things. He cashed in on his abilities. He picked up the lemons that fate had sent him and started a lemonade stand. He took the lemons and made a lemonade stand. Well, as it turns out, it's not just the squeezing of the lemons that make your situation desirable because lemons are bitter and sour. It's the sugar. I have here an example which I prepared earlier. Well, actually, this isn't a, I didn't do it. Wawa did. Uh, this is lemonade, and it is sweet and delicious. Uh, this little bad boy has in it uh, 240 calories, sounds like a lot, and 58 grams of sugar. Now, for those foodies who are out there, you're probably going, Duh! even holding that bottle's making you unwell. Uh, 58 grams of sugar is apparently 114% of your RDI, or recommended daily intake for sugar. That's why when I have one of these for lunch, I spend the next 30 minutes running around the office with a helmet on, playing myself in ping pong, to burn the energy, and then I pass out in a heap for like 20 or 30 minutes, and I come to after that, after the high and fall is gone, and I need to get back to work. Today, we're going to talk about making lemonade from lemons. We're going to talk about this phrase. We're going to talk about bad situations undesirable things that come into your life. Maybe it's global, maybe it's personal, maybe it's private or public. Persecution, darkness, things you don't want, and how to turn the corner with those things into something tasty, something desirable, something beautiful and helpful and beneficial. There is an art to it. And I'll tell you right now, the secret is what you add to the situations. It's never just removing the lemons because we all get lemons. All right, so the key verse for today is Philippians 1, 12 to 18. There are many different translations of the Bible that have this in it. One of them says that this section, the NIV says, Paul's chains advance the gospel. The NLT says, Paul's joy that Christ is preached. And the message says, they can't imprison the message. I kind of like that one best. It's kind of where we're going to sit today talking about Paul uh, in prison. And I like the way it says, can't imprison the message. So we'll go with that one today. Here it is on screen. Verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren of the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former priest preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Verse 17 says, But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. And this, in this, I rejoice and I will rejoice. So just to clarify here, Paul, while writing this letter, is in prison. 
And only if you look at those last three words and will rejoice. He's talking about rejoicing while in prison. Uh, many years ago, I went to visit a prison uh, with my wife and our then child. Uh, that is our current almost 10-year-old. So it gives you an idea how old it is. He was about two uh, in that picture. Uh, we went to San Francisco and we did what you do when you're tourists. We rode the trolley. We got some really great coffee. I went to that Nike store that has the shoe elevator in it. If you are a shoe person, it's like, hallelujah, as shoes come up and down that are all overpriced, but still awesome. So we did the San Francisco thing, and part of that tour was visiting Alcatraz. And Alcatraz is home to some of the world's most infamous uh, criminals, and probably the most famous one was Al Capone. And while there, we got the opportunity to put this headset on, and you carry around this little recording of a prisoner. Um, I didn't get Al Capone, I got somebody else, but they verbally walk you through where they lived for one, two, three, five years uh, while they were imprisoned. As you walk in and out of the cells, what struck me most was just this feeling of lifelessness. It was cold, it was damp, uh, it was devoid of furnishings, you know, couches, TVs, life, etc. And I felt claustrophobic being in there. You can probably tell from the photo, I'm six foot four. And I hardly fit in these things. I put my, my arms out as far as they would go, and I was just inches from each wall side to side, and they were probably two, three inches above my head inside a normal cell. Not only that, they had these solitary confinement cells down below, which were completely dark other than the little slot uh, where you could look through, and I think they slid food uh, underneath the door. So this, this prison was eventually shut down because it was deemed uh, inhumane that you would send someone to Alcatraz. People were going crazy uh, in Alcatraz, even though they still had modern accoutrements like a library. There was a basketball court. They still got fed three meals a day. And there were some uh, governing laws surrounding the uh, prison that held the prisoners. It still got shut down because it wasn't humane. Uh, here we see a scene of, this wasn't Alcatraz, but uh, uh, what we do in our prisons today is we rehabilitate. We uh, will allow prisoners to read and to learn to write and further their education and, and go to church and have a weight room and, and so forth. So their time is bearable and they come out better than when they went in. But let me just say here, the Apostle Paul was not in Alcatraz. He was not in what we, most of the people watching this video, are Americans. He was not in an American rehabilitation center or a prison in any way. Uh, most scholars agree that Paul was in a place called the Tulaneum Dungeon. What a lovely name we have there. This dungeon was built in the 7th century B.C. In other words, 700 years before Christ even walked this earth. It was an old prison, the oldest one in Rome, in fact. And the way it was set up was not to originally be a prison. Uh, lay people could walk in at street level. And you could actually worship in the very top level of this, uh, this building. And then it had several levels below and the levels below were not made for human beings. They were made for holding uh, water where people above would dip their buckets down and, and be refreshed, obviously. So when Paul went to this prison, it was not a joyride. Many scholars believe that they would simply lower people down into prison into one singular hole, and they would put multiple prisoners in the same location. And this was not a rehabilitation center by any means. It was a place where people who were going to die waited out their death sentences. It was, on your way to death, stay here. So they didn't care whether they put one or two or five or ten people together, and they didn't uh, they didn't put men and women in separate cells. So you had this chaotic situation below ground, men and women together, often stripped naked. It was a lemon by any definition of the term. It was a big, stinky, inescapable lemon. 
that Paul was in. According to John McRae, he's a professor of New Testament and archaeology at Wheaton College. He says this, Roman imprisonment was preceded by being stripped naked, then flogged, a humiliating, painful, and bloody ordeal. The bleeding wounds went untreated. Prisoners sat in painful leg or wrist chains while incarcerated. Mutilated, blood-stained clothing was not replaced, even in the cold of winter. In his final imprisonment, Paul asked for a cloak, presumably because of the cold. Most cells were dark, especially in the inner cells of a prison like the one Paul and Silas inhabited in Philippi. He goes on, Unbearable cold, lack of water, cramped quarters, and sickening stench from few toilets made sleeping difficult and waking hours miserable. Male and female prisoners were sometimes incarcerated together, which led to sex sexual immorality and abuse. Prison food, when available, was poor. Most prisoners had to provide their own food from outside sources. Because of the miserable conditions, many prisoners begged for a speedy death. Others simply committed suicide. That's where Paul is. That's the prison he's in as he writes Philippians. Now, let me give you a guided tour. You can still go there today to check it out. Um, when you enter the first level, this is kind of where you would enter at, at that door and head down the first level of stairs. There is a mysterious hole, which today looks kind of like a water or drainage hole. It's got a, a grate across the top of it where that yellow arrow is pointing, which is your entry and exit point to the prison. Once you go down below where the prison was, you can see that same entry and exit point at the top of your screen here. Let me give you a quick tour of what took place in this prison. The uh, yellow area there, is, the yellow arrow, is your, your P corner. The blue area here is for reading. That's like your reading corner. The uh, green is for exercise. That's where you go to uh, stay fit in, in the dungeon. The brown arrow is for number twos. Uh, you go in that area. So that's how they laid out their prison with multiple prisoners in the same spot. Let me put this in layman's terms. The Apostle Paul was in a dimly lit poo pit when he wrote Philippians with other people while he penned this letter to the people who were outside the pit to encourage them in their walk with Jesus. Now for me, it's safe to say in this situation, I'm not praising God. I'm not thanking him for my surroundings. Yet we see Paul in another place altogether. Paul is saying, in this I rejoice. And if you never noticed it before, there is a stark contrast there between the surroundings, the environment, the damp, dark imprisonment, which Paul is literally in, in real life, and the words of encouragement, talking about rejoicing, that he's writing to the people outside the prison. He's incarcerated. And Paul says, guess what, everyone? Good news! I finally have a platform to reach unreached people groups. These are my prison guards. They're outside that little breathe hole in my dungeon. And they're there all day. All I have to do is call out to them and, yoo prison guards! There is not... Anyone reaching these people, Paul's saying, isn't this great? I've been ministering to these people daily, singing songs with them. Oh God, you are my God. Come on, everybody. There's several people in here with him. And I will ever praise you. How's he doing this? How is Paul turning these lemons, if there ever was a lemon, into lemonade and saying, I rejoice that these people are around me in prison. Philippians was written about around AD 61, which makes it nearly 30 years since Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. 30 years have passed, yet Paul is so fervent in his commitment to Christ He's not depressed. He's not self-loathing. He hasn't abandoned his faith. He's in prison in the city where he started many churches. He's a little bit of a local celebrity to a lot of people. Here he is in the worst place imaginable saying, rejoice. 
rejoice. Paul exhorts the Philippians to follow his example and be encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly in Philippians 1.14. Imagine having that ability to make lemonade. So what does it matter, he says, that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. What doesn't matter to Paul? Why doesn't it? Because he actually believes that God's ways are higher than our ways and than his ways. Paul has gone all in on God's plan for him When you read the story of Paul, you understand that he was previously Saul who persecuted God's church and was murdering Christians and persecuting God's church. And God confronted him on the road and blinded him and a conversion took place. Paul knew the power of God and he was committed to God's ability to do whatever he wanted with Paul and his circumstances. So Paul never wavered. He never wavered. I read somewhere, if you can completely comprehend the will of God, you've got the wrong God in mind. And certainly Paul believed this and he lived it out. And see, I think one thing that we today in modern culture fall subject to too often is we make ourselves mini gods. We like to do math. And the math is my circumstances plus my prayer life equals failure because of my circumstances. And we judge. We say, therefore, God's not in this. Because I'm not prospering, God can't be in this. Because I'm being persecuted, because there are lemons in my life, my job, my marriage, my parenting, my relationships, my health, the world, because of the existence of lemons, God can't be here. And too often, you guys, I think, We as Americans or certainly first world Christians, we believe that God has to say either yes or more to our prayer requests in order to be an answer to prayer. But that's for us individually because we're very individualistic. So we think if God says yes to me or God gives me more, yes or more, then he's answering my prayers and God is in this. And the converse, if God ever says no or less, God's not in it. I'm being persecuted. It's the work of the devil. And I want to encourage you today. God's allowed to say no or less. And in this case, prison. I hope and pray never says prison to anyone watching this video. But my point is he's allowed to let us journey through periods like this. Through periods that we hate, that we wish we never had. Because it produces perseverance, which produces hope which takes us away from pessimism, which takes us away from that worldly view of health and wealth and prosperity, which leads us to a place of strength, a place of unity, a place of love, compassion, and joy. Fruits of the Spirit come out of those places, and that's where God wants us. Many people today struggle with the fact that we are so finite, and God is infinite or infinite, and we can't do the math to understand His ways, so we think, God must not be in this. But let me encourage you with this, if it is an encouragement. Remember Job? Job 38. We see Job losing his family, his business, his barns, his animals. He's losing everything except for his sanity, although he almost does. And he's complaining to God. And God says this in Job 38. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. God is calling Job's bluff. God's saying, if you know so much, tell me where you were as I was forming the earth. And the implication is, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes, what I'm going to do with your story in the future. If you take both Job and Paul and their terrible lemon-like circumstances which tasted sour and bitter and painful to them at the time. Think how many people it has brought joy and peace and freedom and salvation and eternal security to since that time. 
Now, I don't know how to do that math. I am as human as the next person, but I do understand that God can make those sorts of decisions. And if we're ever going to turn the lemons in our life into lemonade and make them sweet and desirable and impact the future, I do know this. It can't be health, wealth, and prosperity all the time. We have to go through trials in our lives, through a fire, if you like, to be strengthened, to be hardened, to encourage other people as we persevere with God at our side. So as we conclude, I'm going to give you three tips on how to make lemonade. Number one, squeeze the lemons. They're coming. Nobody cruises through life. This is true if you believe in God and have Jesus as your savior or hate God and Jesus both. We live in a fallen world filled with sinners. Whether it is intentional or unintentional, you will have lemons. Embrace the lemons. Squeeze them. Don't be surprised when they're in your life. There is no translation of the Bible, no story where this isn't the case. There are trials coming in this world. This is not a lemon-free place that we live in. If you're going through a regrettable period, if you're going through something that totally stinks, like Paul, I want to encourage you to look beyond the physical to the spiritual, to look beyond your own circumstances, to think about your friends who are watching you go through it and praying for you and where do you put your hope? Where do you find your trust? What's going to let you know that this has purpose and meaning? If it's God, then they're going to be encouraged. They're going to be drawn to your source of hope. If it's more money, more fame, more celebrity, better looks or fitness, they're going to be looking to those things for their hope. I want to encourage you guys to look to God. Number two, add tons of sugar. Add tons of sugar. What is sugar, you ask? Sugar is the good stuff. Sugar is the best stuff. And in this case, it's God. The more God that you add to your circumstances, to your pain, to your lemons, to the sour things in your life, the more God you put into it, the better. Whether you are rejoicing because you are healthy and your family's close and you get to take as many vacations as you want a year and um, you, know, you have all the, the things that you want. If you're rejoicing and you put God in that in ample measure, man, you're going to be blessed. You're going to encourage other people and draw their attention to God as well. If you're going through something really terrible and it's sour and dark and regrettable, you put God in that situation in massive quantities, 114% of the RDI. And others will be encouraged by the journey you're taking with him and your unwavering commitment to God in your circumstances. And the last one is trust the process. God is refining us and refining this world. There is a process that we need to go through to pick up what he wants us to have. God says in his word, he will never leave or forsake his people. He says he knows the plans he has for you in Jeremiah 29, 11, And they are plans to prosper and not to harm you. He says he will not test you beyond what you can bear. Remember that. God is with you. Remember that God loves you. And love doesn't always mean yes and more. Sometimes it means no and less. Just like a, a good father restricts candy from his kids who want to eat candy. They restrict things that seem good to their kids. Sometimes that's us. And we cry out to God, why God did I lose that thing? Why did you say no to that prayer request? Why haven't you answered that prayer request? And sometimes the answer is in the no or the delay. Let God turn your misery into a ministry that will bless other people. How many times we read God's word and get encouraged by the trials and tribulations of the people in God's word when they overcome or someone in your own life that you see wrestle with an addiction or they pray through something that their kids are going through or they're praying for world leaders and something positive happens. But in order for that encouragement, you need to go through the dark periods. It's a beautiful example of faith and hope despite persecution and trials. Friends, I pray that today's message is an encouragement to you. I want you to look at the things in your life as underneath God's control, that he is with you in your circumstances, despite the sourness of some of them. Do not be afraid. Add God to whatever you're going through today.